guys, we're going to talk today about the reactivity of metals, different metals reacting with oxygen, water, and acids. And that's what we did last lesson. We tabulated all sorts of observations. And today we're going to combine all these observations and create what we call a reactivity series. A reactivity series is basically a summary metals and their reactivity to the different elements. Elements is not, yeah, different elements. Based on from most reactive to least reactive. So remember when we made the observations with oxygen, uh, potassium and sodium in group one, they are group one metals, when you burn them in like a crucible, it will burn really brightly. Whoa, it's like almost white when you look at the YouTube observations. For group two, you're bright, brightly in air, like some of the um, magnesium burning uh, observations you made. And down in the series, from aluminum all the way to copper, it will kind of be slow, it might glow, but it's just a real slow reaction. And for precious metals, such as silver and gold, you see nothing. For water, Group one, when you throw a piece of small piece of group one metal into water, you will see the metal jumping all around the surface of the water. Maybe little sparks or flames will occur. Okay? Calcium, when you put it into water, you see like fizzing. And for aluminum, all the way to iron, what you see is nothing will really happen in cold water. But if you put the metal in the test tube, and at the end of the test tube, you put a damp cotton bud or cotton wool, and you heat the cotton wool, the water in the cotton wool will vaporize, and as it tries to escape the test tube, you will come in contact with the metal, and you see a reaction. <coughs> and finally, we have reactions with acids. Group 1 and calcium react very violently and with acids. And the reason is because acids dissociate into ions. We talked about that in the last lesson. And so the reaction is very violent. The electrons are jump so quickly to the uh, acids that a reaction will occur rapidly. So it's very violent. Uh, from magnesium all down to uh, lead, you will see fizzing. And it fizzes a lot when it's like magnesium, and it fizzes less when it's down in, in the reactivity series. And then you get copper to uh, silver and precious metals, basically no reactivity. So this is what we have concluded. We have tabulated and Summarize that the most reactive is potassium. There's a lot more reactive metals up there, but it's not in this context that we are interested in. And the least reactive would be gold. There's a lot more unreactive elements, but we're not concerned about that. Okay? So, why is this important? This is important because we would like to make predictions when we do metal displacement. What does that mean? And this is one metal displacing another metal element from its compound. The reason we do that is because we want to purify, extract, or to protect certain metals. Okay? So in general, when we want to do a prediction, the more reactive metal will displace the less reactive metal, in which the less reactive metal is part of the metal. So here I have four examples, and these examples we're going to see, uh, we be, should be able to make predictions on whether a reaction will occur or not, or whether a displacement will occur. <coughs> we have zinc metal reacting with copper sulfate, okay? So if you look at zinc, you can find it in the middle of the reactivity, reactivity series, and copper is all the way down there. Zinc is more reactive than copper, and copper is less reactive than zinc. 
So because zinc is more red in copper, when you put the two together, zinc will displace copper, and what you get is zinc sulfate and copper. Alright? What about calcium and copper? Where is calcium? Calcium is up here. Well, copper is also still down there. Calcium is more reactive than copper. So when you put the two together, will it displace copper? Yes, it will. Copper will get displaced. And what you have is copper sulfate plus, I mean calcium sulfate plus copper. <coughs> now let's compare another one. Iron and potassium nitrate. Iron is all the way down in the middle here. Potassium is all the way out there. Iron is less reactive than potassium. So when you put iron and potassium nitrate together, will iron displace the potassium? No, because iron is less reactive than potassium. What about lead and magnesium? Let's look at it. Where is lead? Lead is up down here and magnesium is up here. Lead is less reactive than magnesium. So when you put the two together, lead with magnesium sulfate, will lead displace the magnesium? No, because lead is less reactive than magnesium. So there you go. Simple ways to make predictions where the displacement reaction will occur. Now, finish this off. Here are a couple of industrial examples of a displacement reaction. A thermite reaction is very popular, especially during the railroad building days. When you have aluminum powder with, mixed with iron oxide, heat them up, and what will happen is the aluminum will displace the iron oxide from the iron oxide may form aluminum oxide and molten iron. The molten iron is really hot and it's like liquid. And iron workers or railroad workers will pour the molten iron onto the railroad track to link two pieces of railroad together. Alright? Another method of extracting iron from its ore iron oxide is to put it into a blast furnace. Iron oxide mixed with carbon in a blast furnace. Carbon is more reactive than iron, so carbon will displace iron. And what is formed will be iron, the extracted pure iron, and carbon dioxide, which is basically a gas. So there you go. Some examples of reactivity, displacement series. Uh, I mean some examples of industrial applications of a displacement reaction and us being able to predict whether a displacement reaction will occur inside a lab based on its the reactivity of the metals.